Forbidden Love. An iconic love, up there with Unrequited, Unconditional, and Courtney. And today we're talking about one of the most forbidden loves. The love between an American political candidate and their super PAC. Prohibited by law to even speak to each other, they rendezvous in the shadows. Wait, no, that's not right. They rendezvous extremely in public, which is totally illegal, yet totally allowed, because in federal elections, as in real life, true love finds a way. And that way is through offensively brazen loopholing. And where there's offensively brazen loopholing, there's HAI. The first thing you need to know is that there are limits on how much money campaigns, traditional PACs, individuals, and party committees can give each other. The caps force candidates to earn popular support to fund their campaigns. So in theory, one mega-rich jabroni with terrible taste in senators can't just prop someone up single-handedly. Unless he's got a super PAC. Super PACs, by their mere existence, are what I'm going to call level one sneaky. They're a loophole in campaign finance law that lets in bigger donations. See, in 2010, the Supreme Court ruled that political groups can collect and spend as much money as they want from whoever they want as long as they're doing, quote, independent expenditure, i.e. not directly collaborating with campaigns. In the 2022 midterm elections, Super PAC spent $1.3 billion outspending every candidate and political party because it's so easy for them to do it. Basically, if I'm running for president, my campaign, Sam for Prez, is subject to all these limits. But the super PAC supporting me, half as president, isn't, as long as they're not in cahoots with the campaign. But here's the thing. We at Sam for Prez really want to be in cahoots. We want HAP to spend their infinite money in a way strategically aligned with us, and we want to help them raise more. So now it's time to get level two sneaky. Super PACs want donors to know that supporting them supports their candidate, but they can't have their candidate's name in their name. Hence why Joe Biden's was called Unite the Country instead of Joe Money, Joe Problems. But Carly Fiorina's in 2016 was called Carly for America because they insisted Carly stood for conservative, authentic, responsible leadership for you. But what did America stand for? As a presidential candidate, I cannot solicit donations for half as president. But I can appear at their fundraisers as a quote, special guest, only suggest people donate up to $3,300 and get out of there before the money moves. I can't work with HAP on ad buys, but we can both hire the same political consulting firm to produce our totally separate ads as long as that firm pinky promises the Federal Election Commission that there's a firewall between us. What does that mean? Legally, nothing. As long as the consultant says there's a firewall, as far as the FEC is concerned, there's a firewall. Here's how blatantly shared vendors coordinate campaign and super PAC activities. In 2016, the Trump campaign and the NRA Super PAC each hired one of the Slater's Lane media strategy firms, so named because these quote-unquote distinct firms are all located on the same street and are definitely one thing. The Trump campaign placed 52 ad spots targeting adults aged 35 to 64 in Virginia. That same week, the NRA Super PAC bought 33 ads on the same station the same week targeting the same demographics with the same messaging. Somehow, that's independent expenditure. But here's my favorite loophole. The FEC forbids any private communication between campaigns and super PACs. Did you hear it? Private communication. That's right, political campaigns and super PACs can collude as long as they do it in public. And they've got some bold methods. Like, obviously you can't film an ad for your super PAC, but if you randomly post a bunch of B-roll of you getting stuff done and your super PAC happens to use it for ads, that's their business. That's why Ted Cruz posted a full 15 hours of himself wandering around, and also why I made Jet Lag the Game, footage for the Super PAC. There's also a trick called red boxing, where in peak campaign season, candidates hide totally unsubtle messages to Super PACs on obscure corners of their websites. For example, Sam for Prez would have a red box saying something like, voters age 18 to 24 need to hear that Sam is a total legend with a pristine track record on transit policy, which the folks at HAP would turn into a bunch of radio ads saying exactly that, train pun included. And these instructions aren't just on candidates' websites. The major party committees each run their own sites that give thinly veiled instructions on what messaging to use for each candidate. These are, legally speaking, publicly available internet materials, so it's allowed. Like if you tweet your strategy and a super PAC happens to read it, that's just a happy coincidence. And when I say tweet your strategy, I mean it literally. An advisor to the Buttigieg campaign tweeted this during the 2020 race, and within a week, a PAC ran an ad in Nevada following his instructions. The FEC let it slide. In 2014, two followerless Twitter accounts started tweeting seemingly nonsensical strings like this, and when CNN found them and reached out to the Republican Party with questions, the accounts were deleted within three minutes. 
Why? Because most likely, these tweets contain data from polls super PACs had conducted, and this was a public, coded way to let campaigns see the results. They're not actually that nonsensical. The letters at the front are state postal codes, the last number is reliably an existing congressional district in that state, that looks like a date, presumably the date of the poll, and the other numbers look like polling results. That's as far as I got, but better nerds than me looked across the tweets and figured out the code, which is this. Say it with me, publicly available internet materials. So yes, political campaigns and super PACs are forbidden from communicating, but not in the Romeo and Juliet way where there are consequences. It's more in the Charles and Camilla way where they do whatever they want and then run a country. Wait, hold on, what's this? HI viewers who want to support independent creators and get access to tons of original content should know about this video sponsor, Nebula. Well, if the red box says so, hi, HI viewers. Are you sick of ads? Do you want early access to content from your favorite creators? Do you want exclusive videos that will never be on YouTube? Well, a little birdie told me that you should know about Nebula. Nebula is a platform I started with a few of my closest political allies, home to an unbelievable array of top quality content made by the creators you know and love, but with bigger budgets. Seriously, if you enjoy the stuff all these creators make on a YouTube budget, just imagine how good the stuff they can make with more is. Stuff like real life lore series Modern Conflicts, breaking down today's real life wars, and all the fun and borderline nonsensical things I've made, and all their classes, like Sarah Feldman's on producing a pop song, Tony Santos's on video editing, and Bright Trips on ocean safety. It's seriously an amazing content library, all without ads, without algorithms, and designed with an economic model that enables creators to make more of their best work sustainably. There's a reason over 600,000 people have signed up so far, and if you want to join them, when you sign up using the link in the description right now, you can get $20 off a yearly subscription, meaning you pay just $2.50 a month for everything Nebula has to offer. It's a great deal for you, and a great deal for us, since we get a cut of your fee for as long as you stay subscribed.